Hello everyone. My name is Myron Means. I am the Large Carnivore Program Coordinator with Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. We have a little bit different format this year for the bear hunting seminars that I usually host across the state. In light of the COVID issues and having places reserved for large groups of people, we're going to do a virtual, uh, we're going to do an, a virtual hunting uh, seminar. And uh, it's gonna it's gonna be a little bit different than just what you would typically hear, but I'm gonna try to cover all the things that we would normally cover in a hunting seminar. We're gonna talk about the history of black bears in the state. We're gonna talk about the biology of black bears. I think it's really important to to know those um, things about the uh, animal that you want to pursue. And we're also gonna talk uh, specifically about hunting private land versus hunting public land in the state. And I'm gonna give you, uh, you know, some tips that you may not know about or some, some things to work on, whether you're gonna hunt public or private land in the state. And then we're also gonna talk about field care of uh, harvested animals, how to process meat correctly, and maybe even some recipes for, this, for bear. Uh, as I said, I think it's really important, uh, you know, if you're going to hunt bear in the bear state, I think it's really good for people to have an understanding about some of the history of black bear in the state and some of the biology. To cover some of the history of black bear in the state, uh, I always like to show people what the distribution of black bear was historically across North America. As you can see from the slide, black bears range from Central America all the way across the states up into the northern portions of North America and had the widest range of any bear species in the North American hemisphere. By 1995, the range of the black bear in the middle uh, U.S. had been restricted to Arkansas and, Oklahoma, or Arkansas and Missouri, uh, as you can see from the slide there, basically the Ozarks and Washita's. And really the, uh, the thing that led to the decline of the black bear uh, in Arkansas was unregulated market hunting. A lot of people think that bears were hunted for their fur or for their claws or something like that. And certainly those things were utilized in the bear trade. Uh, but it was the unregulated market hunting uh, that really almost uh, caused the extirpation of black bears in Arkansas. At the time of settlement, there was estimated that there were 50,000 black bears in the state of Arkansas. And by the 19, early 1900s, it was thought of that we may have only had as few as 50 bears remaining in the state. Bears were hunted through the turn of, or through development, the 1700s and 1800s, bears were hunted for their fat. Uh, so there were really only a couple of really good prominent sources of oil for oil lamps, for heating, lighting, and everything else at, at the time the country was becoming uh, founded. And one of them was whale blubber. We all know what happened with the history of whales. They were almost hunted to extinction. And the other one was bear fat. Well, what better place to get bear fat than the bear state? Uh, so, you know, at the time of early settlement, uh, Arkansas was rich with bear and a lot of people came here just to market hunt bears. That's how they made their livelihood. Uh, we have some towns in the state that were really founded kind of on the bear trade. Oil Trough in Northeast Arkansas is one of the towns, you know, it was established to render bear fat down it went down through wooden troughs in the middle of town, down troughs and loaded onto barges uh, and big wooden barrels right on the White River there at the banks of oil trough and shipped down the White River, down the Mississippi, all the way to the port of New Orleans and probably went all over the world. Uh, so <clears throat> the bear trade was thriving at the time of settlement in Arkansas. Uh, by 1951, a man named Trustin Holder did a land survey of the state, and the only remaining bear population he found in the state was the lower White River area called Scrubgrass Bayou. It was thought we may have had 50 bears remaining out of 50,000 at that time. To bring back bears to the bear state, 
the Game and Fish Commission in 1958 embarked on what is now a historical reintroduction effort. Over a 10 year period, they went to Minnesota and Manitoba, Canada and brought back 254 bears, restocked them at sites in the Ozark Mountains and the Washita Mountains. Uh, this is kind of give a shot of what, what it may have looked like back in the 60s, you know, bringing bears back. Uh, conservation agencies really just can't, uh, it's difficult for them to do historical reintroduction efforts like this. But through that reintroduction effort, the population, uh, the bears were put in areas with really good habitat. The populations flourished and uh, they flourished to the point that it gave us basically our current black bear distribution across the state now. We have a very healthy distribution in the Ozarks, a very healthy population in the Washtals and in the Gulf Coastal Plain and the southeast part of the state. Uh, that reintroduction effort is key in that it allowed us to reopen bear season in the bear state in 1980 and we've had a bear season in the state since and it's also key in that it is still considered the most successful reintroduction of a large carnivore in history not just in Arkansas or the US but anywhere in the world and so uh, you know that's a that's a very that's a very important thing, uh, accomplishment that we're proud of with Game and Fish. Not only that we brought bears back to the bear state, but we've had a thriving population ever since. Bear hunting has come to the point that it is a great hunting resource for the people of the state of Arkansas, and not only for the people of the state of Arkansas, but people of surrounding states are coming to Arkansas to bear hunt. So we're quickly becoming the place to go bear hunting in the southeastern part of the U.S. Let's talk a little bit about uh, our management history with bear in the state. Uh, it rocked along for a couple of decades, uh, basically just monitoring the populations. And in 2015, we took a turn in the statewide bear plan and said not only are we going to maintain the current populations in bear zone 1, 2, 5, and 5A, but we're going to maintain monitoring protocols for those populations and we're going to increase monitoring efforts in bear zones 3 and 4, which is the Gulf Coastal Plain part of the state. We're going to man have management strategies for a bear hunting season in bear zones 3 and 4 once a sustainable population exists. Let's talk about, let's talk a little bit about historical bear harvest in the state. Uh, as you can see from the slide, uh, I didn't go all the way back to 1980, but as you can see from 1990 until current day, it's just been a, con a consistent increase in harvest throughout the state. One of the things that made uh, bear harvest uh, dramatically increase in the state was in 2001 when the AGFC implemented allowing baiting as a uh, harvest strategy or a, a hunting strategy for bear. Up until 2001 bear hunting or bear harvest was incidental to deer hunting. There wasn't a lot of active bear hunters in the state. There were a lot of active deer hunters. Deer hunters go out and deer hunt if bear season was open, they see a bear, they could shoot a bear. Uh, but that really wasn't getting the harvest where we needed it uh, for the state. Uh, we try to harvest approximately 10 to 15 percent of the estimated population in, uh, in a bear zone or a bear population. And uh, the incidental harvest up until 2001 wasn't enough. Uh, so in 2001, we allowed baiting as a management strategy uh, for bear. And that, as you can see from the slide, that jumped the average harvest from uh, 150 or so to probably 300 plus in 2001. Uh, we've also done things, despite the increase in harvest, we've also had an increase in bear population, uh, constant increase in our bear populations. In, the Ozarks and the Washtals. And so uh, what we have done since 2001 has 
we have liberalized hunting strategies to help increase that bear harvest to get it to where it is sustainable to the population, but it also steadies or stabilizes the population. Let's talk about how our harvest is broken down in bear hunting. Uh, one of the key things that we, information points that we use in harvest is male versus female. Uh, because bears have such a low reproductive rate, and I'll get into that in a minute, uh, it is very important for us to not over harvest the female segment of the population. So anytime uh, we have a higher percentage of males in the harvest and adult females, that's good. That's what we want to see in bear management. This year was a typical year, 246 out of 186 uh, compared to 186. 432 bears were harvested last year. And that ratio, 57%, uh, something like that, uh, male to female to 43% female is, pretty typical ratio of what we see historically with male to female harvest. In 2019, uh, harvest by zone is another breakdown that we use harvest information from. Uh, as you can see, bear zone one had 112 females, 161 males. Uh, uh, same for bear zone two, 70 females, 80 males and then bear zone five and 5A. Uh, but in both of those zones, we're seeing higher male harvest than female harvest, and that's, that's what we look for, that's what we wanna see in bear management. Uh, this is kind of a biggie. Uh, a lot of people over the last several years, you know, there's been uh, some season restructuring uh, to allow opportunity for either muzzleloader or modern gun. Uh, but typically, uh, last year's harvest in 2019 really kind of fell out about the same way or your average harvest does in any given year. Archery always accounts for the dominant uh, harvest strategy for bear. Uh, you know, years where the maybe the zone quota in zone one closed earlier, you're going to have even higher percentage of archery harvest. Uh, so, you know, our bear hunting framework is really kind of structured to uh, the archery component of harvesting bears. We, uh, we realize that, and bear hunters realize this as well, as bear managers and bear hunters, uh, the earlier you get out there, the better your chance of success is when hunting bear. Uh, a lot of times, uh, and, and I'll speak more about this in the hunting portion of it, but uh, you know, bears are actively feeding a lot at the front end of archery season. When you start getting into the gun season, especially into the middle part of November, a lot of bears are restricting their range, males and females alike. And so the opportunity isn't there. They have a shift in behavioral, uh, uh, daily behaviors. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Just to kind of give you an idea of how the, I guess the seasonal food supply runs in any given year up until the hunting season. We monitor nuisance complaints. Uh, harvest strategies can have an effect on nuisance complaints. Uh, nuisance complaints is more, are more closely related to seasonal food availability rather than population. If Mother Nature provides plenty of food, we have very few complaints. If it's a drought summer or a late freeze that kills berry crop or something like that in the summer and Mother Nature is not providing the food, that's when we get a lot of bear complaints. So it's not necessarily tied directly towards hunting strategies or bear populations, but hunting strategies can affect nuisance complaints. Now let's talk a little bit about bear biology. 
uh, I think it's uh, I think it's essential to understand some basic facts about bear biology to be an effective bear hunter. Uh, cub production, as I said earlier, you know, bears have a very, very low reproductive rate. Uh, on average, adult female bears only have two cubs per litter every other year of their life. Uh, they're not like deer, they don't re reproduce annually or turkey or any other game animal. So, uh, you know, in the, in the world of game animals or game managers, you know, bears are considered to have extremely low reproductive rates. Uh, when, even though they are long-lived animals, bears can live 25 years in the wild. We, uh, the Game and Fish has documented bears reproducing at 20 and 21 years of age in the wild. Uh, but they also are three to five years old before they even start reproducing. So, <clears throat> and uh, as an adult female goes, uh, you know, if she's, if she's four years old when she becomes mature and starts breeding, uh, if she lives to be 20 years old, she has 16 years of productivity. Uh, of those 16 years, she's only going to have an average of two cubs every other year. Uh, so that's only 16 cubs in her entire lifespan. And if you consider that most of those cubs, the majority of those cubs will be males because males have a naturally higher mortality rate. Uh, you know, out of those 16 cubs, she may have five females or six female cubs. Uh, even though they have a higher survival rate than male cubs, still five or six cubs in an entire lifetime, or uh, female cubs in an entire lifetime is very, very low uh, recruitment rate. So in Arkansas, the average is uh, two cubs per adult female every other year. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about the life cycle of a bear uh, to kind of understand how their behavior uh, runs through the hunting seasons. Uh, bears are born in January in Arkansas. Cubs are born in January. Female has the cubs while she's in a den cycle. She emerges from the den cycle during that first year uh, with her cubs typically in early to mid-April. Uh, the cubs weigh about 10 pounds, 12, 15 pounds. They stay all summer with the mother and fall, basically learning how to be bear cubs, learning how to be bears. Uh, mother's teaching them what to eat and everything else. They go into that second den cycle with their mother, usually about mid-November in Arkansas, and they'll stay with that mother through their second den cycle. When they come out of that den cycle as yearlings, uh, they'll typically emerge in mid-February, early March, and they'll hang around mom for a month or two until long about the 1st of May. She will actively drive her yearlings away from her because May, mid-May to late May is the start of the breeding season for bear in Arkansas. Uh, everyone is, that hunts is familiar with the deer rut and uh, the deer, the rut or the hunting season for deer is kind of structured around the rut. Uh, bears uh, rut is in the summertime. So by the time hunting season rolls around, actually the rut or the breeding season has nothing to do with the hunting season. Uh, so that's, that's a big difference with bear than other large game as deer or something like that. So uh, she drives the uh, yearlings away. Uh, she'll have her breeding season in late May, June, or July in Arkansas. And uh, she'll carry, those, uh, carry that embryo and have a partial gestation period all the way up until the time she goes into the den. There's actually a period of arrest, but we won't get into that. But during the fall, it is very important to understand, not just with uh, pregnant female bears, but with male bears 
uh, alike, it's important to understand that prior going to going into a den cycle, they enter a euphagic phase. In other words, they gorge. Uh, uh, they're going to feed 16, 18, 20 hours a day on berries that are available in the late summer, hickory nuts, acorns that are available in the early fall, any food that they can get their paws on, so to speak, they're going to gorge and gorge and gorge. And it's that euphagic period occurs across most of the hunting seasons, the archery season, the muzzleloader, and the modern gun. And so that's really the behavior that those bears are under during the hunting season. It's not a rut, it's a euphagic phase where they're gorging. And another thing to remember about how the cub production or the recruitment of yearlings plays out is uh, I have a lot of hunters ask me in the fall, well, I have a bear coming to my barrel and I don't know if it's a male or a female. Well, if it's a female with cubs of that year, those cubs will be in tow with her. Uh, she'll rarely be very far from those cubs. Uh, so, you know, if you have a camera set up or something like that, you know, we certainly encourage people not to shoot females with cubs of that year. Uh, you know, we don't want to orphan cubs, even though it's late enough into the fall where they would probably have a stronger chance of survival than cubs that were orphaned early in the summer. Uh, man, that second year with the, uh, with the mother in the den cycle, going into the den cycle, you know, that just gives those uh, young bears uh, a better odds of survival. It just gives them another leg up. So, you know, we encourage people to, uh, if they are hunting over a bait site or even a natural area and have bears coming in, if they're concerned, well, they don't know if that's a female or a male or something like that, uh, just give them a little bit. And if she has cubs by that late in the year, she'll have those cubs pretty close in tow with her. So, uh, you know, those are just some of the things to consider while you're out on the stand uh, getting ready to bear hunt. Let's talk a little bit about age and sex determination on bears. Uh, some people may want to try to harvest specifically, uh, some people may want to try to harvest males, uh, males only, uh, which is great. Uh, but how do you tell a, a male from a female, you know, bear, uh, you know, one that's average size, 150, 200 pounds or something like that? When they're really, really big, it's obvious that a male, if you can see on this slide here, the bear on the right side, uh, that's obvious male. Uh, females do not get that big. Uh, they don't have the big necks, the broad necks, the broad heads with the little bitty ears. But the main telltale of male bears versus female bears is the structure or the anatomy of the front end of the bear. Uh, if you can look at the wrist size, the width of the front foot, the forearm size, the neck size, and you see it's big wide wrist, big wide forearms. Uh, you know, it's got a thick neck on it. Typically, that's gonna be a male. Males or bears are built bigger on the front end because male bears are the ones that have to do the fighting to compete for the breeding rights of a female. Female doesn't have to fight for the breeding rights of a male, uh, it's vice versa. So males are always built heavier towards the front end for fighting, uh, for competing for a female. Female bears, on the other hand, tends to, tend to have very small wrists, they have narrow front feet, uh, they have small forearms, uh, they tend to have narrow heads, you know, they don't have to have the big neck muscles to fight. So they're built more pie-shaped, uh, heavier towards the back end, and males are built more rectangular shape, heavier towards the front end. Uh, and that's, you know, uh, 
if you see enough bears, even in the wild, uh, normally, you know, you can get pretty good at judging whether it's a male or a female. Uh, so if you're trying to harvest a male or something like that, other than the obvious, uh, those are just some of the things that might help you determine whether or not you have a female. If you have a solitary bear coming to a bait site or coming to a white oak tree, uh, those are some of the things you can look at to determine, hey, is that a male or a female? Uh, another thing, uh, you know, bears are really kind of hard to judge size-wise. Uh, I have a lot of people uh, call me and say, man, I, I saw a bear that was 300 pounds, or I've got a bear in my backyard and it weighs 300 pounds, and I get there and it weighs 120 pounds. Uh, you know, bears kind of invoke a lot of excitement. Uh, they're really furry black animals, so that makes them look bigger uh, than they probably are. Uh, so I always tell people, judge a bear by its ears. And uh, one of the things to determine, it's just kind of a anecdotal information, but by the time those cubs are a year old, they have all the ears they're ever going to need in life. Uh, by the time they're a year old, their ears actually do not grow, very little at all. So a bear actually grows into their ears. <clears throat> so if you see a bear coming to a bait site, its head is kind of narrow. Uh, it's kind of got a small frame, but it's not any good reference for size. You see these big Mickey Mouse ears on its head. It's a young bear. Uh, you know, if you... If you see a bear coming, uh, have pictures of a bear, and it has these little bitty ears way on the side of the head, then you know you can, ratio-wise, you can tell that, yeah, that's a good adult bear. So judge a bear by its ears, so to speak. <clears throat> Weight. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that, A, male bears get as big as they do, in Arkansas, uh, I've heard of several bears and seen bears that have been harvested well in excess of 500 pounds. Uh, I've heard of bears 600 pounds plus males that have been harvested. Uh, <clears throat> females, on the other hand, uh, do not get very big. An adult female may range 150 to 225 pounds. Uh, an exceptionally large female may weigh 300 pounds. Uh, you know, a tip, an average male may weigh 250 pounds. An exceptionally large male will be in excess of 500 pounds. So we really have some big bears in Arkansas. You know, most of the bears that you're going to encounter in the Ozarks or the Washitals are probably going to have some ancestry to the northern bears that were brought down in the 50s and 60s. And there's a rule of science or a law of science called Bergman's Rule that says animals of northern hemispheres have larger body mass than animals of southern hemispheres. We see this in deer. Uh, it's really prominent in deer. If you take a Canada buck as opposed to a Florida key deer, you know, uh, same age may be three or four times difference in body mass, uh, weight-wise. Uh, bears do adhere to Bergman's law to some degree, but probably not as, uh, as hard as whitetail or something like that adhere to it. So weight, uh, it can vary greatly between sex, whether it's male or female. It also varies greatly by food supply. Uh, I've seen drought summers when bears look like a bag of bones. Uh, they literally look like a skin or a skeleton with skin draped over them. And then we have a bumper mass crop in the fall and that same bear six months later, uh, We've done work with females in the den that may be 150 pounds in August. Uh, we go back in February after a bumper mass crop and that same bear weighs 250 pounds, you know, six months later. And that's when she's had three months of food. So uh, weight can vary greatly by sex, 
by food availability, certainly by age. Uh, you know, I'm going to say in a, an average uh, yearling in Arkansas, yearling bear may weigh anywhere from 40 to 70 pounds. Uh, you know, a good adult bear will typically weigh a male, a good adult male that's at least four or five years old will probably weigh 200 plus, you know. So, uh, it, it <clears throat> weight, I have people ask me every year, what's a state record bear in Arkansas? And I get quizzed on that a lot. And to be honest with you, as far as uh, bear managers go, weight means nothing to us. We don't keep records of bear weights. Uh, and, and it's so variable with bear. It's, it's just one of those things that really means nothing to us as far as bear managers go. Uh, so, but, you know, it may mean a lot to you as far as, uh, you know, as far as what you consider a trophy or whatever else. So, have people ask me all the time, how do you, how do you know how old a bear is? Well, part of the, I guess, uh, checking requirement to fulfill your checking requirement for black bear, you must submit a premolar uh, to game and fish of your harvested bear. What we do with that premolar is we take the premolars in once we receive them from all the hunters. We send them to a lab up in the northwest. That lab takes all the teeth from the harvested bears. They decalcify the tooth. They cross-section the tooth, actually the root of the tooth, uh, they cross-section it, mount it on a slide, and then they give an age estimate for that tooth. And the way they do that, as you can see from the slide, there are rings on that tooth. Those are cementum rings that are laid down annually by a bear, and because they go into, they have a feast and fast lifestyle. In other words, they grow in the spring, summer, and fall, and then when they enter a den cycle, they're not eating, they're not drinking, so they don't grow. Uh, and that cementum compresses, that cementum layer compresses on that tooth. Uh, and then in the spring and summer and early fall when they grow, it expands. And then in the winter it compresses and then it expands. So uh, if, you can or if you know the process of the bark rings of a tree, uh, the way the cambium layer compresses on a tree, uh, it is the exact same principle with bear and their cementum layer on the tooth. So you basically count the age rings of a tooth. Uh, it's not as hard and fast of a rule in Arkansas as it would be, say, in Minnesota, uh, but it's still applicable. It still gives us good information in Arkansas even though the uh, denning cycle isn't uh, as, as prominent in the south as it is in the northern states or so forth. So, uh, and we use those age records to look at the age of our harvest, the age structure of harvested bears. And as you can imagine, it's, uh, it's pretty typical of any other species. You always have a higher number of younger animals harvested in a population and then the bell curve drops down and eventually tapers out. Now, before we get into the hunting portion of this, uh, there's something that you really need to know about black bears is, A, black bears are kind of nearsighted. Uh, they don't have to have great uh, vision to avoid predators or something like that. They are the predators. Uh, they don't have good hearing. Uh, they have little bitty fuzzy, you know, ears on top of their head. It's not like big radar ears of a deer or something like that. So they don't have the greatest hearing. Uh, what uh, is uh, where they are king is their sense of smell. Uh, I've heard different estimates of this, you know, but a typical canine nose is 150 to 300 times stronger than the average human nose. We all know dogs have great sense of smell, drug dogs and everything else, bloodhounds and, and all that. Well, imagine a bear having 
over a thousand times stronger sense of smell than the average human nose. So to say that bears can smell good is a pretty gross understatement. Uh, I tell people all the time you can beat a bear's eyesight, you can beat a bear's hearing, but you absolutely cannot beat a bear's nose. And uh, that, is, that is just, that's really kind of the number one thing that you have to keep in, your, in the back of your mind when you're bear hunting, whether you're stand hunting, whether you're still hunting, no matter how you're doing it, you have to keep that factor in mind. And uh, it's uh, <clears throat> all the scent lock in the world that you can buy and all the magic sprays that you can spray on you absolutely will not beat a bear's nose. So, uh, you know, those are some of the things you have to keep in mind when bear hunting. And let's talk about hunting. Oh, let's wait. Uh, just another anecdotal fact of uh, <clears throat> bears in Arkansas, and this is more relevant to the mountainous bears, the Ozarks and Washita bears, as opposed to the Gulf Coastal Plain bears. But uh, about 25% of the bears in Arkansas have some color phase other than just black, whether that be a chest blaze or whether that be a coat color variation cinnamon, uh, brown, chocolate, or whatever. Uh, about 25% of our mountainous bears are some color phase other than black. So let's talk about bears. This is, uh, uh, this is very relevant to hunting, is the locomotion of bears. They're extremely quick animals at short distances. Uh, they can swim like a fish, but more importantly, they can climb just like a squirrel. Uh, bears utilize trees for forage. Bears utilize trees for avoiding danger. Bears utilize trees for lounging. Bears utilize trees for denning. Uh, there's not any port part of their life where they don't utilize their climbing skills. Uh, and I always tell everyone, you know, if you want to know how important it is for a bear, uh, just think of the mass crop in the fall when the white oaks get ripe but they haven't fallen to the ground yet. All the deer have to wait until they fall and hit the ground. The squirrels and the bears don't have to wait. They climb the trees and go get them. So a uh, very important uh, thing to keep in mind and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Now let's talk about the hunt. I really kind of wanted to approach hunting uh, from two different scenarios. Either A, you're going to have private land and establish a bait site, or B, you're going to hunt public land and utilize natural food sources, or what I call natural bait sites. So <clears throat> our active open bear hunting zones right now are Bear Zones 1, which is the Ozarks, Bear Zones 2, which is the Washita's, Bear Zones 5 and 5A in the Gulf, uh, well, the lower Mississippi Valley surrounding uh, the White River National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we don't have a bear season on the refuge, but we do have a bear season on the private land surrounding the refuge. Uh, <clears throat> bear Zone 1, Bear Zone 1 does have a quota. Bear Zone 2 does not have a quota. And I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain this because I get, I get a lot of questions uh, from in-staters and out-of-staters every year. Well, it really doesn't have anything to do with the densities or the population of bears in either zone. It has everything to do with the land dynamic uh, within those bear zones. If you took a map of the Ozark National Forest, about 1.2 to 3 million acres of public land, basically right in the heart of Bear Zone 1. That's really what we consider to be the core of our bear population in Bear Zone 1. Uh, it's not the only place there's bear, but that is the core population. 
So if you took a owner, land ownership map of Bear Zone 1 and you put the Ozark National Forest map on it and all the private and public land, you shaded the public land green, you shaded the private land white, it would just look like a salt and pepper mix all the way across all that public land. When we allowed baiting as a harvest tool in uh, 2001, we knew that in areas of large public land, but a lot of interspersed private land, we knew that all the bears that live on the public land are susceptible to being harvested on the private land. Perfect example, you can have a 5,000 acre block of national forest and you can have five acres of private land right in the middle of that block. And if there is a mass failure that fall, you could bait up a real rich bait site on that private land and you could have untold number of bears at that bait site susceptible to being harvested, which would otherwise not be uh, accessible to being harvested if it was all private land. So the private land component is really what drives the quota being established in Bear Zone 1. If you look at Bear Zone 2 and you consider the Washita National Forest, uh, which is in Arkansas, I think it's 900,000 a million acres. Uh, if you look at it on a land ownership map, it's really kind of one contiguous block of public land. In other words, the bears that reside and live in the core area of that national forest are probably not going to be real uh, susceptible to being harvested on any given year. So it's, it's the land ownership dynamic between Bear Zone 1 and that core population and Bear Zone 2 and that core population that really drives the quota system. Uh, Bear Zone 2, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of self-limiting. Regardless of how many days we put on the bear season or something like that, you know, it's kind of self-regulating, so to speak. Only a certain number of those bears in any given year are typically going to be susceptible to being harvested. Uh, and it is the exact opposite in Bear Zone 1. Uh, you can have a mass failure and, uh, you know, that's, that's going to put three-fourths of the population out there being susceptible to being harvested at a bait site. Uh, and we've seen, we've seen evidence of this. You have, if you've been a bear hunter for very long, you've seen evidence of how dramatic it can be in mass failure years when, uh, you know, two or three years ago when the cl quota closed in Bear Zone 1 in three days. And, you know, the year before that it closed in four days. And the year before that it went all season without being closed. So you can, you can see evidence of how the private land component affects the harvest of bears and bears on one. And so you can look at the length of the season and basically follow the mass productions through the fall. So, you know, those are kind of the, some of the meaty questions that I get every year. People do not understand, well, why do we have a quota here? Why do we not have a quota here? And, you know... So hopefully that explains it a little bit and makes it a little more understandable. If you want to look at the county distribution, I have a lot of people ask me every year, well, in Bear Zone 1, you know, what, where, do I, where do I need to look at or where do I need to go? Uh, just look in Bear Zone 1, it's, it's easy. Look at the counties that have a lot of public and private land interface the counties that are surrounding the National Forest, <clears throat> uh, Madison County, Newton County to some extent, but Franklin, Johnson, Pope County, all those are border counties around the National Forest. And if you look at this chloroplast, you can see Johnson, Newton, Madison County, uh, Pope County, Searcy County, those are always the top harvest counties in Bear Zone 1. Why? Because they have a lot of 
bears that live on the public land most of the year and they're susceptible to baiting during the uh, hunting season on private land. So uh, you have an ideal situation. The same thing with zone two. If you look at the high harvest counties in zone two, it's always Scott County, uh, Polk County, uh, to some degree, Yale County. Uh, you know, those, those are the counties that have a lot of public and private land interface where people are baiting, drawing bears off of public land onto their private land. But that doesn't mean any county in the zone can't be a productive county. Uh, it just kind of depends on your individual uh, uh, place that you hunt, where, you know, as I said before, whether it's public or private, or uh, just what your little slice of the world is, is like. So uh, that's just, a lot of people ask me, well, where do I go and where do I start? And so that's kind of where I tell people, uh, you know, if you, if you want to look for a piece of private land uh, to lease or something like that or debate on or start knocking on doors, you know, look for a piece of private land that has good interaction or good, uh, uh, is, is around public land, has good public land uh, close to it. Maybe not necessarily right next to it or surrounded by it, but just good access to public land where those bears are going to be living the rest of the year. Uh, a lot of people start out by, you know, saying, well, it's a trade-off. Uh, In-staters and out-of-staters alike, I get questions every year, well, I don't know if I want to hunt, you know, bear zone one or bear zone two. Uh, and I tell them, well, these are the... You know, these are the things that you're presented with in making that choice. Uh, zone quota is present in uh, zone one. Zone quota is always going to be there in zone one. Uh, zone two, I probably won't ever have a, another quota again, but I don't know. We'll see. Uh, the season structure is virtually the same in bear zones one and two. So season-wise, the opportunity is exactly the same. And a lot of people... You know, they misunderstand the quota. They think there's more bears in zone one or whatever. But there's actual equal densities of bear in both populations. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really uh, you're comparing apples to apples as far as densities. Season structure, it's apples to apples. But when you're talking about the quota, it's apples to oranges. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, uh, you know, the habitat in both areas, if you're wanting to hunt public land, the habitat's really kind of the same. You're going to be looking for the same things in the same time of year in both habitats. You're going to be looking for your hard mass that's coming on during the fall, whether it be hickory nuts or uh, acorns, you know, the early droppers like white oaks or something like that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Okay, now let's shift gears and let's start getting down to the, you know, the meat close to the bone, so to speak. Let's talk about the actual hunt. And I want to break that down into two uh, sessions. I want to talk about hunting public lands and I want to talk about hunting private lands. First, I want to cover public land. And you'll see, uh, you'll, you'll find that there's a lot of overlapping strategies uh, between hunting public land and private land uh, because uh, the way I approach hunting public land is a lot like I would approach hunting private land. And uh, in hunting public land, the three most important things that I can tell anyone that wants to bear hunt public land in Arkansas, the three most important things are scouting, scouting, and scouting. I cannot emphasize that enough. Uh, that doesn't mean that you have to spend every day for a solid month prior to bear season scouting. That's not what I mean by that. Uh, but scouting will put you in a position to be successful. Uh, if you don't scout and want to rely on just dumb luck, you know, I tell people all the time I'd rather be lucky than good any day. But uh, that's not necessarily the same case uh, when you're bear hunting. 
Uh, you're going to have to put in your time scouting just like you would put in your time running a bait site. So let's talk about scouting. What are you going to start looking for? Uh, if I'm scouting public land, I'm just going to run through this and kind of give you all scenarios on what I would do if I was scouting public land. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go out in late August. I'm going to go out when that last little bit of soft mast is available uh, in, the, in the late summer uh, when bears are starting to go into this euphagic phase. And that last little bit of food available on public lands is going to be things like devil's walking stick, the plant, not the insect, uh, elderberry, pulpberry. Uh, these are all very prominent soft mass bear foods in the fall. And that's what I'm going to go look for. I'm going to go out and I'm going to drive the roads. You don't necessarily have to get out and put a lot of boot leather on the ground in late August. Uh, it's 5,000 degrees and you really don't have to do a whole lot more than just drive the roads. You want to look for those pulpberry patches that are right on the side of the road. You want to look for those devil's walking stick uh, patches that are on the side of the road or walk down logging roads or something like that. A lot of these late season foods are kind of fringe open area food sources. In other words, know where pokeberries grow, know where devil's walking stick grow. They don't grow out in the middle of a deep ravine. They grow in the edge of open areas, whether it be roadsides, whether it be food plots, whether it be, uh, you know, ditches or something like that. So you can cover a lot of ground, either driving or, uh, you know, if it's a UTV area on a UTV on trails or something like that. So you can cover a lot of ground doing that and you want to find those areas where those bears have been foraging on those foods. It's real easy to tell if a bear has been foraging in a devil's walking stick patch uh, because devil's walking stick have these big berry clusters that are, you know, eight, nine, ten foot up on a thorned stem and bears just break them over and they eat the berries out of the top. Same thing in a pokeberry patch. If a bear's been eating pokeberries, they'll lay down in them and pull them over and they'll just wallow the whole patch out. And believe me, it's easy to tell if a bear's been in there because stuff's going to be broke, it's going to be wallowed out. If it's an elderberry patch or something like that, it's the same thing. So drive the roads, walk the trails, drive the trails and find those late season, those last little pieces of soft mass available, okay? Then, as you start transitioning into the early part of September, especially mid-September, that's when you're gonna have to put some boot leather on the ground. You know where the bear was in late August. It's not gonna be far from those areas in mid-September. Uh, and let me back up in saying something. Uh, of course, whatever method you choose to hunt with is going to dictate how you scout. I'm approaching all of this from an archery standpoint because I said before, the earlier you approach bear hunting, uh, whether, you know, the earlier in the season, you make the effort, the better your chance of success is. Uh, they're a lot closely tied to the food that is available right then. So if you're, you know, if you're gonna gun hunt, you may not necessarily need to go out in August and start looking for the last bit of soft mass, or if you're gonna muzzleload hunt or something like that. If you're gonna archery hunt though, uh, you definitely need to know where that soft mass is available in the late summer to start your scouting from. So <clears throat> you move forward a couple of weeks and it's mid-September. Uh, you know, uh, you have to know, to be an effective hunter, you have to know your trees. Uh, because I can assure you, the bears know trees. Uh, you have to know what trees produce the best mast and when they typically drop that mast. 
So uh, you have to know the difference between a white oak family and a red oak family. Uh, you have to know the difference between a northern red oak and a white oak, between a white oak and a post oak, uh, between a black oak and a southern red oak. You have to know those. By far and away, bear are no different than deer. The more palatable hard mass acorns are white oaks. And that can be any white oak in the white oak family, whether it be post oaks, whether it be white oaks. Uh, they're not as palatable, or they're more palatable than the red oaks. Uh, your northern red oaks are probably the least palatable of the red oaks. Uh, you'll always find northern red oak acorns lying on the ground if they produced uneaten in any given year. Deer don't really like them that much. Bear will eat them, but they're the least favorite. Uh, but there is a preference as you move towards away from northern red oaks and say uh, black oaks. <clears throat> black oaks are a red oak species, but they're actually pretty preferable, pretty palatable red oaks for bear. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Bears like uh, black oaks. So uh, they like any white oak over a red oak. And as you start going into the red oak species, probably the most palatable is going to be black oak. Uh, water oak uh, or, or willow oak, they're a very palatable red oak species. Uh, your less palatable are going to be your southern red oaks, your northern red oaks, uh, your cherry bark oak, uh, oaks like that. And I, I can't really think of any other areas in the state where the prevalent oak species isn't going to be one of those five or six. So keep that in mind. Uh, you have to know the trees. When you go scouting, you're going, to, you're going to have to understand that white oaks will typically grow on the ridge tops or in west south facing slopes. Uh, your red oaks are typically going to grow on east or north facing slopes. So if I go out there and I know in this particular part of the world the poke berries were broke down just all around this food plot. I mean they were wrecked. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say, okay, where do I think I'm going to find white oaks if the white oaks are producing acorns? I'm going to go down the ridge tops. I'm going to go down the west facing slopes and I'm going to go down the south facing slopes and get on benches. I'm going to take my binoculars with me because I'm going to have a good survey of that general area by the time the day is done of where the white oaks are at and what kind of production. Ideally, what you want in hunting public lands, you want a marginal mass crop. And I will say that this year is looking to be that way. Uh, from the areas that I've seen in the Ozarks and the people that I've talked to in the Washtals, it's gonna be a marginal year, which means in white oak production, you're going to have white oaks. Uh, you're going to have a tree here that has a pretty good uh, production on it this year. But it may be the only tree in 10 acres that has uh, a, good white oak, uh, a good white oak crop or a good acorn crop. So you want to find those benches. They don't have to be way off down in a drain, uh, completely, you know, half a mile from anything because bears don't care. They're gonna go where the food is. If it's 50 yards off of a well-traveled food plot, you know, that doesn't mean that bear's not gonna utilize it. May utilize it mostly at night, but it doesn't mean a bear's not gonna utilize that. And I will say uh, the amount of pressure, hunting pressure on public lands during archery season isn't a fraction of what it is during the muzzleloader or gun season. So that's another big plus if you're archery hunting. Uh, you know, just cause that area might be overrun with blaze orange during the uh, gun season or muzzleload season, there may not be a soul in there during the archery season. So keep that in mind too. 
But know your trees, know where they're at, and what you're looking for in the optimal opportunity or the optimum situation is a marginal mass year. And go find those trees that have good production. <clears throat> okay, so it's mid-September. The season starts in two weeks. Uh, I'm going to go and uh, I have found a white oak bench. Uh, you know, it's a couple of benches down off of a point. Uh, man, there's three or four white oaks that have, real, that have really good acorn uh, crop that year on them. But there's only three or four of them. Uh, how do I know the bear is going to use them? Uh, it's a virtual guarantee the bear is going to use them, but they're not going to utilize them until they get ripe. So you're going to look around in the general area, you know, right up on the hill, uh, you found the poke berries and all that stuff. You got off down in here. It's, uh, it's, it's fairly remote. It's a good place. You got everything set up. Man, I got three or four trees. I would probably come back a week before the season and chances are some of those white oaks are going to be getting ripe. Well, that's when you're really going to dial it in. When they start getting ripe before they hit the ground, those bears will climb up those trees and break branches over and strip the white oak acorns off the branch before they ever fall to the ground. They're not going to do it when they're green. They're going to do it when they're ripe, but before they hit the ground. So uh, you take your binoculars with you, you know, you're surveying around, you think, oh, I found this tree, these white oaks on this bench. They were producing. You're going to go in there maybe a week before the season, and that's when you're really going to dial it in. You're going to say, you're going to look at these trees, and you're going to say, oh, there's claw marks on this tree right here. They're going up and down it, and it's pretty easy to determine if a bear's been climbing up and down a tree. You're going to see nice claw marks going up, nice claw marks going down. But more importantly, you're going to see bear scat everywhere. Bears have a very, very short gut. Uh, so that means anything they eat comes right out pretty quick. And a lot of times, if they're eating on acorns, uh, they will feed solely on acorns, which means... If you took a handful of white oak acorns, you threw them in a blender, you turned it on for three or four seconds and poured it out on the ground, that's exactly what bear scat's gonna look like. It's gonna be a corn milly mixture. There's gonna be half of acorns in the pile that are undigested. It's gonna be easy to determine that it's bear scat. Uh, you can see the bear scat in, in the slide up there. Uh, you can virtually tell in any given season what is present, what the food source is that's present during that season. Uh, if it's blackberries, it'll be exclusively blackberries. If it's wild cherries, their scat will be exclusively wild cherries. Same with hickory nuts or acorns or poke berries. So uh, you find a, if a bear is actively foraging in an area, for more than about 30 minutes, you're going to find scat, and you'll find a lot of it. That's a good sign. And what that bear will do, it will forage exclusively in that spot, that tree, that bench, until one of two things happen. Either the bear gets bumped and pressured out, or the food source is gone. So if it's a week before the season, you're thinking this is on a south slope, Okay, how am I going to approach this? How am I going to get in here without a bear, bear smelling me? Because I know there's several trees left down at the end of this bench that still have a lot of good mass on them, and a bear's probably going to work his way down these trees. And you might come in three days before the season, sneak in there in the middle of the day when it's the least likely time for a bear to be foraging, uh, even though they forage 16, 18 hours a day, it's probably the least likely time. You're going to sneak in. You're going to take a quick assessment of the area, find out where the freshest sign is, and then you're going to sneak out. 
You know, also one of the early season signs you can look for when that summer soft mast is, is starting to wane and uh, maybe that transition between late August and mid-September uh, when the hard mass is starting to ripen. Uh, one of the things that, that I look for a lot whenever I'm setting snares or whatever doing research work, and they do this all year, is I call it rock rolling. Uh, they take, uh, you know, if their soft mass isn't really available, and uh, the hard mass isn't ripe yet, what's the next best uh, item on the menu? Insects. Uh, you know, and bears, um, you know, about 15% of their diet is made up of insect matter. And so what are they constantly doing? If the berries aren't ripe and the acorns aren't ripe, or berries aren't there and the acorns aren't ripe, they're walking through the woods and they're rolling over rocks, eating ants, grubs, whatever. They're tearing apart logs, eating ants and termites or whatever else is out there. So they're just constantly doing this as they're going through. There's basically no wasted effort on a bear's part in obtaining food. So look for all those rocks uh, that are flipped over on your hillside, you know. I go through when I'm looking for an area to trap or something like that in the summer when we're putting research collars on, on bears, I look a lot for rock rolling, especially if it's before the mass crop hits, the blackberries are ripe. I'm going to go through an area and you, you'll know if a bear's been there. There's going to be rocks turned over. Uh, some areas you may go to, there may be, you know, of a thousand rocks on a hillside, there may be 20. Some areas you may go to and every rock on the hillside's turned over, even the little small rocks this size. So, you know, that's some, that's some pretty good evidence of, of bear activity. So don't forget the rock rolling then you have to figure out how you're going to approach it opening day. I tell everyone that I would never ever go into an area before daylight no matter how good it was on opening day because your chance of bumping that bear out of there in the dark is very very high. So and people usually look at me like I'm crazy when I tell them this, but it's opening day. Regardless of whether you're hunting in bear zone two or bear zone one, the quota is not going to close on opening day. Okay? So you've got at least opening day, probably the second day. Maximize your opportunity and don't blow it on the first day. Don't go in there an hour before sunrise and walk through there and leave your scent and everything else and have a bear be in there and bust them out. Wait until daylight, preferably wait until the morning thermals start moving up those slopes if you're approaching from the top. If you're approaching from the bottom, from underneath, then you can go in, you know, Downdrafts happen in the morning as the sunrise heats them. You have thermals that move up mid-morning. So understand how thermals work. Uh, much if you were elk hunting out in the west, you know, in the Midwest or something like that. You know, elk hunters always use thermals to their advantage. They hunt up in the morning, they hunt down in the afternoon. Uh, it's kind of the same way about bear hunting. You're going to approach, unless you have know you're going to have a south wind that morning or you know you're going to have a west wind that morning. You know you want to approach your stand or where you're going to put your stand based on the thermal action of the day. Uh, you know what is better to go in there and be there right when the crack of dawn hits and take a chance on busting the bear out or would you rather go in there at nine o'clock and virtually ensure that that bear doesn't know you're there and have the thermals work to your advantage and come in at 10 o'clock, you know. So you, ha you have to make sure that you don't put all your hard work, uh, make sure it's not in vain by slipping up on the opening day. I tell people to go ahead and wait till daylight, wait till you have your wind right approaching your hunting area, still hunt into your hunting area, because remember, bears don't hear that well. Bears don't uh, see that well. So uh, I've had several uh, people uh, 
uh, that I've helped bear hunt before. Now these are, are public and private land people and I tell them, look, still hunt into your barrel, still hunt into your flat. And I've had several people tell me, hey, uh, you know, I waited until good and well after daylight and I still hunted in there and I saw a bear foraging and I stalked right up on them and, you know, successfully harvested them with the bow. Uh, I had one guy that uh, I took into a bait site and I, I dropped him off uh, about 300 yards away and I said, still hunt into this barrel. You know, and it was well after daylight, he still hunted within 12 yards of this bear and he got him. So, uh, but I mean, uh, still hunt into your areas and don't blow it. Uh, and what I really, what I guess what I'm really attributing that to is a lot of the techniques that I learned for baiting private land is that bears are extremely habitual in their activities and their behavior at that time of year. They're not in a rut. They're not worried about things like that. The only thing they're worried about is food and water. And they get very habitual in their daily activity. If you run a bait site, a lot of times you'll see those last couple of weeks before the season starts, you'll see the same bear, he'll show up every day at the same time. They get extremely habitual in their patterns, in their behavior, in their activity. So if a bear comes into this place at 4 a.m. in the morning and you blow him out, you've disrupted his pattern. You've disrupted his activity. And believe me, bears are smart enough to realize he's not going to come back in an hour. He's not going to come back in two hours. He may come back in three or four hours, but what he's probably going to do is downwind that stand uh, flat bait site downwind it about 200 yards and he's going to check out what's there before they come into it and you'll never know he was even there uh, he can come 300 yards he can come 400 yards from it it don't matter if you're there he's going to smell you or she's going to smell you and they're not going to come in i have a real good friend of mine that has he's bear hunted in arkansas uh, for for years and years it's got a lot of land it's great land it's in northern Pope County, and uh, I call him the old bear hunter. And, uh, you know, he kind of has a saying that says, you know, a hungry bear will take chances. A full bear won't. And he's exactly right. Uh, you know, if a bear's kind of full and, you know, hey, they don't have to take a chance to go in there knowing there's something wrong in there, they're not going to do it. So uh, keep that in mind. A hungry bear will take chances. A full bear won't. So uh, also, one of the things you're going to look for coming into this area when you're thinking about your stand placement, if a bear is foraging anywhere, or any amount of time at all in an area or a tree or a bench, they're going to A, leave a lot of scat, and B, they're going to leave good trails. Remember what I said, bears become extremely habitual this time of year. In other words, if they're feeding on a flat, they're going to come into this flat the same direction and they're going to leave the flat the same direction. It might not be the same way they come in, but every day when they come into this white oak stand, they're going to walk the same trail. I can guarantee it. Uh, you know, a different mare may come in from this way, so you may have two trails. But uh, in any given bear coming into a feeding area, they're going to approach it the exact same way most of the time at the exact same time of the day. And they're going to leave the exact same way. So if you've got bears actively feeding in a flat, find the trails and set your stand up in accordance with or relative to that trail. You don't have to stand, set it on the tree, so to speak. Set it on the trail. Set it wherever you can get the wind right for wherever they're coming into or where they're actively feeding. The trail's probably the better set or the better investment. You know, I would rather set a stand on a really 
well worn out bear trail than on an individual tree. Uh, how do I know it's a bear trail? Uh, bear trails are very distinct and if they have been using them any length of time, they stand out like a sore thumb. You can look down a trail and a deer trail and usually deer trails are about that wide and they're pretty worn out all the way through. Bear trails are a little wider. They may be this wide. They may be 10 inches wide. But if you get down and if you look down that trail for any distance at all, you'll start to see small depressions in a depression, in a depression, in a depression. And you can literally determine every place that bear has put their feet walking down that trail. People say, I don't believe that. That's crazy. That's nonsense. Try it out. Get down and look at that trail, especially if you find really good bear sign. Look down that trail and every little stick you see, you'll see a depression either in front of it or behind it because the bear won't step on that stick. Every rock, you'll see a depression where they put their foot in the same place every time walking down that trail. I've seen them on public land. I've seen them on private land. There's no doubt about it. It's a bear trail. So look for the trails and the tracks. Uh, water sources are a great opportunity, especially in late summer, early, early bow season. You know, it's usually dry in Arkansas. It's usually hot in Arkansas in late September. Uh, you know, sometimes the bear season opens at 90 degrees. Sometimes the bear season opens at 75 or 80. Water is always a really good source. Bears eat so much food that time of year, they will go to water probably every day and drink. So if you have a, you know, a spring or a pond or something like that, usually ponds are a great source of, uh, to, you know, focus uh, for deer to, or for bear to concentrate on. And you may, you may see several trails coming in and out of a pond, bear trails I'm speaking. So uh, water sources can be great. And I said before, absolutely know your trees. Uh, absolutely know your wind patterns, but more predictable than a wind pattern, know how your thermals are going to move in, uh, up and down or east and west through your hunting area, because that's what you're gonna have to concentrate on. Remember, uh, you will not beat a bear's nose. Uh, I'll give you a real quick, for instance, they've put GPS collars on polar bears before in the Arctic, and their polar bears are on hunt patterns. They're zigzagging like this into the wind, and all of a sudden they stop and go 42 miles to a whale carcass. And uh, I mean, you think you could smell a whale carcass 40 miles away in sub-zero weather? Uh, that just kind of tells you how good a bear's nose is. Uh, no amount of sprays, no amount of scent lock clothing will eliminate your scent from a bear. So you have to play the wind and you have to hunt smart. Okay? Right now we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about private land bear hunting. And by private land bear hunting, I mean uh, establishing a bait site, or maintaining a bait site on private land. Uh, I myself, I hunt on private land. Uh, I have bear hunted some public land some. I've sent uh, some friends and some other people, you know, to public land areas and told them, look, use these techniques. And uh, they've been successful at it. And before I get too deep into the private, I want to emphasize that hunting on public land and finding the right food source and approaching that food source hunt-wise, approaching it in the correct manner can be every bit as successful as having a bait site on private land. Uh, you just have to do it the right way. Uh, so let's talk about private lands and establishing a bait site on, on, uh, on private land. The most important thing that you can do is consistency in your baiting routine. This is by 
far and away the most important part of baiting. It's more important than the kind of bait you use, how long you bait before the season, or anything like that. The consistency in your routine is essential. Uh, because what you're going to do is you're going to allow that bear over time to pattern your activity around that bait site just like you pattern their activity around a natural food site or something like that. Uh, and bears, I can assure you, if you bait for any length of time, more than, more than about a week and a half, if you bait for any length of time, a bear will establish a routine on that bait and it will pat start to pattern you on that bait. So consistency in your baiting routine. And I'm going to explain to y'all how I kind of approach uh, uh, my, my bear hunting lease that I'm on. I'm on it with a few other individuals uh, and I do, there, some of them are from out of state, so I do, uh, I do a lot of the baiting uh, for us, not all of it, but I do a lot of it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from opening day. I'm going to say, okay, I know what my routine is going to be. Uh, I'm going to bait every three days. Okay, the third day is going to be a bait day. So I'm going to start from opening day, which is going to be the fourth Saturday in September, and that's going to be a bait day. And then I'm going to back up every three days prior to that to however far back I want to go, whether I want to bait, you know, the full 30 days prior or if I want to wait three weeks prior or something like that. Uh, I'm going to back up, and that's where I'm going to set my baiting routine. And... Uh, I have to kind of tell on myself a little bit. Uh, I didn't actually develop a lot of these techniques. A lot of these techniques were handed down to me uh, from a guy named Brian Bachman, who used to be the president of the North American Bear Foundation. Uh, Brian spent, he was kind of invaluable in, uh, in coordinating with us when we established a, a baiting uh, option for bear. And uh, because he, uh, not only being the president of the North American Bear Foundation, but he had also run a bear hunting service up in Minnesota for, I think, 20 or 25 years prior to that. So, you know, he was, he was intimately familiar with uh, baiting as a strategy for harvesting bear and some of the, you know, things that you come into management-wise for baiting bear. So he's the one that kind of handed these techniques down to me. So, you know, they were pride, uh, tried and proven techniques uh, long before Brian ever told me about them. But uh, I have used them for a number of years in Arkansas, and I can assure you uh, they're bulletproof. Uh, they work. So I'm going to set opening day as my bait day. I'm going to back up every three days. I bait every three days. You don't have to. I'm going to back up every three days from then, and that's when I'm going to start baiting. Uh, I may start three weeks prior. I'm going to go bait. A part of establishing your routine is not just the day you bait, but when you bait. That's probably as important as establishing a routine of days. I'm going to typically bait sometime between 11 and 3 o'clock, in the middle of the day, basically. Uh, that... What that does is that if there are bears actively feeding at your bait site and they're active in the area, they may not be at that bait site in the middle of the day, but chances are they're going to be close enough to where they may hear you come in and leave. And, or even if they are at your bait site in the middle of the day uh, and you bump them off, it's no big deal. You've got plenty of time to fix that you know, prior to the season. And so you come in, you bump a bear off, or you come in, you dump your food out in the middle of the day or whatever, you bang around on your bucket and you're singing or whatever, and you're going to load up and you're going to go to the next one. And you're going to do that every three days. 
or you're going to do it every five days, or you're going to do it every other day. I probably wouldn't recommend doing it more than about every three days because that's just, it's probably too much of a constant at a site. And I think that has a tendency to push a lot of your older bears into a nocturnal pattern. Uh, I will say that a lot of your older bears might use a nocturnal pattern regardless if you do everything right. Uh, I've had some bears before that are really, really big dominant males. You can tell they're older males. They probably weigh close to, you know, 500 pounds. You know, they're probably in their teens. They've survived for umpteen hunting seasons. And uh, regardless, if you do everything right, you never get a daytime picture of those bears. Uh, it may happen. It may not. Uh, but, uh, you know, those old bears didn't get old by making foolish mistakes. So, you know, don't be disappointed if that happens. Uh, but approach it, your bait side at the same time on the same schedule. And that allows every bear in that area to utilize or to pattern your activity. And the reason why I say opening day is a bait day because uh, all the guys that are going to hunt on our lease, nobody hunts in the morning, especially opening day. As I said before, the quota is not closing opening day. So if you ensure that your highest chance of probability, maybe it's the afternoon of opening day, you're still not going to do anything to foul up your highest chance of opportunity. Uh, so when I go in and say, uh, say I bait at 3 o'clock, and uh, I'm going to go in there, and if I have a stand in place, which I should already have by this point, uh, because I'm going to go in probably three to four weeks before the season, I already know when my barrel is going to be, and I'm going to place a stand on the prevailing downwind side of that barrel. Or uh, if, you, if you really want to take Arkansas's weather into the equation, you're going to put a stand on the prevailing downwind side of the barrel and then a stand on the prevailing upwind side of the barrel because the first thing that's going to happen is after you've had a southwest wind on your barrel for the last three weeks, come opening day, you're going to get an east wind. So uh, those are the crazy things that will happen in Arkansas. So if you have the opportunity, put your two stands up. That's not going to matter. The bears don't care. Uh, but you will have an option wherever they have their trail coming into that barrel, you will have the opportunity to be on the downwind side of that trail. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, and, well, where do I put a barrel? A lot of people. Well, you're going to look for the same kind of things that you would look for on the public land. Uh, you going into an area, say you have, uh, you know, a thousand acres uh, to put a barrel on. Uh, you're going to look for rock rolling. You're going to look for pretty easy access to water. Uh, you're going to look uh, in the areas that the bears might normally be there, uh, the south-facing slopes or something like that. I will tell you if you're determining where a barrel is going to be, don't put it two benches down that you have to carry 50 pounds of dog food down there or something like that. You know, put it to where you can easily access with a four-wheeler. Uh, the bears don't care if you drive up and dump it in from the four-wheeler. They don't care. They're going to pattern that activity. So, uh, you know, if you have 40 acres uh, to hunt on or 10 acres to hunt on, well, you may not have such, a, you know, your, your site may be kind of limited to where, well, I've got three good trees I can put a stand in. So, uh, but where you determine your barrel is basically, uh, you know, make it work for you more than the bears because the bears will find your barrel and they'll come to it uh, if, if everything's right. Uh, so be predictable and consistent. Uh, the type, the... Second most asked 
question other than where do I put a barrel or something like that is what type of bait do I use? Um, I hunt on a lease and we have six members. We have six sites that we maintain. And uh, so I purchase whatever bear bait that I can get in extremely large volumes, extremely cheap. Uh, if you've got one bait site that is halfway across the state and you're only able to visit every weekend, you know, hey, I work in Jonesboro, I can't get over to Izzard County to put my bait out, but every weekend, okay, that's fine. Take enough bait, take a hundred pounds of dog food and some grease and oil and, uh, you know, make you a bait site that you go to every five days. Uh, you know, the main thing is don't put so much food there uh, that you're going to put yourself in the poorhouse uh, baiting because it can be a very expensive deal. Uh, number two, don't put so much food there that it's going to spoil and rot uh, before before the bears have a chance to eat it. Uh, and number three, don't put so little food there that first bear that comes up is going to eat 10 pounds of dog food and there's going to be three pounds left to get by through the rest of the week. So, uh, you know, your first bait on a site, if you're not familiar with the area, it's going to be kind of a learning curve. Okay, I went back and half the dog food was left. Okay, well, don't put out that much next time. Put out a little bit more to give some fresh food. Uh, and then you come back the second time, well, lo and behold, you know, it was all cleaned up. Okay, we'll put a little bit more out. You know, what you, what you want is you want enough food there to keep bears coming on a consistent basis. You don't want it to dry up and them to get disinterested in the site. Uh, but you don't want a bunch of stagnant rotting food there either. Uh, so the easiest thing for me to use, you know, if you're in the CWD zone, uh, you know, there are restrictions with the corn and everything else. There are exemptions for dog food or something like that. I use dog food just because that's what I prefer. A lot of people use pastries or something like that. Uh, I don't really have access to a truckload of pastries. Uh, and number two, pastries usually come individually wrapped and I don't want to mess with the trash and taking them all out. I mean, my lease is on someone else's land and the last thing I'm going to do is trash up someone's land. Uh, I want to use something that's clean. I want to use something that's easy for the bear to eat, inexpensive, and, uh, you know, it doesn't make a big, huge mess. Uh, so I use dog food. I can get a ton of dog food for just a few hundred bucks. Uh, so, uh, and it's easy for me to handle. It's easier for me to take around and pour into the barrels. Uh, bears love it. Uh, you know, they don't really care if it's expensive or cheap dog food. There's no acorns out there, so they're happy to get the dog food. Uh, one of the tricky parts of it in the type of bait is I always use a certain amount of cooking oil, preferably used cooking oil, cooking oil from a fish place, from a barbecue place, something like that. And uh, <clears throat> when I pull, pour the dog food into the barrels, I'm gonna pour a little bit of used cooking oil in there. We all know what you know fish grease smells like or fish oil smells like after a fish fry. It's real aromatic, bears love it, okay? It's really high in calories. But more importantly, as a bear is dipping its foot in there or raking that dog food that has that cooking oil on it, raking it out and eating it, it's getting that cooking oil all over its paws. And by the time that bear gets done with that site, he's going to have it all over his paws, all over his mouth. All, you know, he's just going to have it all over him. Well, when that bear leaves and goes wandering around, Every place he puts his foot down, or she puts, his, puts her foot down, and another bear is wandering along and smells that spot, they're going to go, oh, and they'll backtrack that scent right to your barrel. 
So in a matter of a few visits uh, to your barrel, if it's done right, you're going to have an absolute spider web of scent scattered across who knows how far, okay? Until those bears start using it consistent enough to where they're coming in trails, the same trails, you're going to be spreading your scent out everywhere. And so that's probably one of the uh, most beneficial techniques is the cooking oil. You don't have to saturate. You don't have to put 50 pounds of dog food in a barrel and five gallons of cooking oil. Uh, any of you that ever cleaned up after a fish fry knows that a little bit of fish oil goes a long way. So, you know, 50 pounds of dog food in a barrel, half a gallon or maybe a gallon of fish oil, something like that, or oil from a barbecue place or something, you know, that's going to get all over everything, and bear's going to have it all over them. That's enough. You don't just completely crease out a bait site. Uh, so, types of bait. You know, that's just going to depend on what you can get available to you, how much you want to spend, uh, how easy it is for you to uh, work a site. I uh, have a good friend of mine that was actual, uh, he was baiting in an area of private land that had no access to it. The only access he had to it was by mules. And he found that popped popcorn uh, was something that he could carry, I mean like lawn and leaf size bags of this stuff into an area he could only go in about once a week. Uh, and he would take a lawn and leaf bag full of popped popcorn. It's light, it was easy to deal with, and that's how he baited his very remote area. Uh, so, you know, I mean, be creative be resourceful, and really whatever it works for you. It's not necessarily the type of bait, it's the when, you know, when you place it in your routine. Uh, as I touched before, stand placement. Um, you know, know your, know your stand placement. Uh, know the prevailing wind uh, for, what you're, for where you're hunting. If you have strong late morning thermals, if you're hunting on a hillside where the thermals are gonna be racing up the hillside, uh, place your stand accordingly. If you know you're predominantly gonna be hunting in the evening or late evening, and you have down uh, thermals uh, in the evening uh, when that cooler air sinks, place your stand according to that. If you're gonna have an opportunity to hunt midday or evening, uh, place them according to that. To cover both sides of the field, uh, put stand, put two stands opposite each other. Uh, so know your stand placement, know your wind patterns. Uh, so uh, understand. Here, here's another thing that you probably need to understand uh, in a public land site, as opposed to as well as a private land site. You need to understand a little bit about bear behavior around a food source. Uh, and this slide that I have will illustrate that to a T. You see the slide in the top portion is a big dominant male. Look at the size of his neck and his head. Uh, I mean that barrel's a 55 gallon barrel and that bear dwarfs it. There's no question that is a big dominant male coming to that barrel. When he comes to that barrel, he owns that barrel. Uh, when a big dominant male comes into an oak stand that has oaks, he owns that oak stand. Uh, he's not, he doesn't care about sharing it with the girls, the kids, nothing. That's his, it's survival of the fittest, and he takes ownership of it. The exact same thing with the barrel. If you have a big dominant male using a barrel, especially in daylight, don't expect to see other bears around that barrel anytime that male is there or even close to it. Uh, you know, it can be a blessing and it can be a curse. Uh, it can condition a lot of your younger bears and females 
to circling that bear site, uh, that bait site, 200 yards downwind and checking to see if the big male's there before they even come close. That's going to be a curse. The blessing would be you were sitting in your stand when the big dominant male decided to show up one afternoon or one late morning in daylight. So understand that, you know, younger bears, female bears will tolerate other bears being around a barrel at the same time they are. The slide in the lower portion, you know, obviously uh, those are all quasi-adult bears, uh, but they're younger adults. Uh, you know, I suspect that there's probably a couple of females. The one that has his head in the barrel, uh, you know, that may be a, a male, but he's probably a three or four, maybe even a five-year-old male. He's certainly not the, uh, the bull of the woods, so to speak. So, you know, they'll tolerate each other around a bait site. Uh, but when, uh, when those big dominant males show up around a bait site or around a natural site, they own it. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully you'll see pictures, plenty of pictures like the uh, one on top. Uh, let's talk a little bit about barrel specs. Uh, here are the do's and don'ts of a uh, bait barrel. Uh, do have a bait barrel that is A, chained to a tree, cable to a tree or something. Uh, I would suggest having one out of plastic, not metal. Uh, metal edges can be harsh on paws and legs and heads and ears when they're sticking them in these barrels. Uh, so I would recommend plastic. Uh, don't cut round six, seven, eight inch holes in a barrel because invariably some bear with the perfect size head is going to walk up to that barrel and stick their head in it instead of their paw in it and they're going to get their head stuck in that barrel. Uh, I've taken, I've had several calls from bear hunters over the past years calling me a week, two, three, four days before the season and says, man, I got this bear and he's got his head stuck in my barrel. Can you come out and do something? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I applaud them for calling. Uh, but yeah, we have to go out and I'll have to tranquilize it. And, you know, especially metal barrels are the worst. Uh, go out and take a sawzall and cut the barrel off their head. Uh, so, but make an oblong uh, slit. If you can see in the picture that I have here, it's kind of an oblong hole, something that, uh, you know, will not necessarily let the bear get their head in there, but they can get their paws in there or something like that. Give them fairly easy access to the food. Uh, but um, they can't get their head in there. If they do, they can bend it around and get it out. So no round holes. Make them oblong, rectangle shape or something. Okay, um, I'm going to deviate from the program here in just a minute, and I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you all a quick example of uh, uh, being consistent and being habitual in your activities, and how how quick these bear will uh, uh, pattern your activity. A real good friend of mine that I'm on the bear lease now, several years ago, uh, when I first met this individual. Uh, we got to know each other through a mutual friend and he wanted to come down. He wanted to come down and bring his, uh, bring his dad with him. I mean, he, his dad was 82 at the time. Uh, he hunted with a crossbow and he'd been bear hunting a couple of times before with his dad and they'd never even seen a bear and a mutual friend of ours got us connected together and he said, man, I really want to come down and bear hunt. And I was like, okay, I had a great place and I said we'll, we'll fix you up and he said uh, so first thing uh, I mean this this guy is, is eats sleeps and drinks bow hunting I mean he's hunted big game all over North America uh, you know hunted elk and rams and moose and and everything and but he he had never uh, killed a bear and so the first thing that kind of set him off kilter was the fact that I told him to show up opening morning at about nine o'clock. 
uh, I was meeting him at this small town outside the land. And so, uh, you know, that was the first thing that kind of, he figured, you know, I don't know what he expected, if he expected to meet the day before and they were going to go in at 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, and everything else. But I said, no, we'll meet at about 9 o'clock at this little town. So we met. First thing he does when he got out of the truck, he introduced himself. And so he's just chomping at the bit. And he said, so you really think we'll see a bear? <laughs> I told him, I said, yeah, I think you'll see a bear. I think if uh, everything goes right, you'll have an opportunity before, you know, before evening. So we go up there. It's a pretty good drive into the, uh, into the property, and we're getting everything ready. And, and I'm going to take him and his dad in when I bait, and I'm going to drop them off. They're getting up the stand. They're not saying a word. Uh, and I told him, look, I'm going to get there and I'm going to make my usual noise, bang around on the barrel and all that. We're not going to laugh and cut up because I always bait by myself. And so the bears don't hear a lot of laughter. They don't hear cutting up. They don't hear voices and everything. They hear me banging around on a barrel. And I said, while I'm doing all this, you're going to get your dad and you're going to take him up and put him in the stand and and, you know, just kind of explain to him how we're going to do all this and the bears won't know any of the wiser, right? So I take him in to stand about 3 o'clock and we have radios. And uh, before we left to go in, he's like, so you really think we'll see a bear? <laughs> Trust me, we'll see a bear. Uh, you'll see a bear. So I take him and his dad in there. His dad's 82 years old. It's probably the last opportunity he was going to have to hunt bear, you know. And I get him in the stand. I bait. I go off and I go and bait another stand. And I get back to the to the cabin that we were staying in. I wasn't there 30 minutes. And he calls me on the radio and said, we just got one. And so I go back down there and his dad had killed a, killed a nice, respectable male. Uh, Russ said, uh, he said, man, he said, y'all weren't gone 30 minutes. And he said, he said, that bear came right down that trail, right where you said he was going to. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just how, it doesn't work that way every time. But that's how predict, predictable bears uh, can be once they pattern you in your activity. And that's how predictable they can be coming into these natural food sources as well. So don't do anything to deviate from those plans. All right. <clears throat> now, let's talk about some crucial things to understand once you've done everything right and you're going to have an opportunity to harvest a bear. A, number one, if you are bow hunting, understand bears are notorious bad bleeders. Bears have a lot of fur on them. A lot of times the side fur and the belly fur at that particular time of year is three to four inches long. Uh, bears are putting on a lot of fat that time of year so there is a lot of fat even in the rib area a lot of fat between the skin and the meat and the bone and the the vital cavity so anything any arrow that you send through there has a potential of the wound has a potential of being closed up by fat uh, hair soaks up blood and bears are just notorious bad bleeders so know that okay so know that bears have a very very uh, small shot window uh, their lungs aren't as big as a deer's lungs their liver they have large livers uh, but their ulnus radius their humerus their scapula are all very dense bones uh, so you know it's not like a deer shoulder or something like that they have very big bones so uh, their shot window is a little s smaller. And uh, you'll see from this uh, diagram that we're going to show up, bear's sh vital area is actually a little further back from the shoulder than a deer's. And so if you're wanting to get a heart shot, you're not, you don't have to tuck it right in beside the bone and the shoulder blade. You can actually scoop back. But the most important thing to remember about shot placement is that that hair on their belly is three to four inches long. So where you would normally 
harvest or shoot a deer with a bow and arrow, you know, a rule of thumb I always used was 50% and half of that. You know, if I took 50% of the body and I dropped below the 50%, you know, that's right on the heart shot for a deer. Well, it's not necessarily that far down with the bear because they have thick skin and they have three or four inches of fur. So you may take 50% and shoot right there on a bear. And that may be the perfect shot placement on a bear or just below it. But just remember, it's, it's, it's higher up from the bottom line, from the bottom silhouette. It's higher up on a bear than it's going to be for a deer. Uh, and the other thing is to, if you're archery hunting, and I cannot stress this enough, uh, don't be prepared for the hot weather. If it's 85 degrees and you shoot a bear right before dark, don't let it lay overnight. Because I can assure you of one thing, that bear will be spoiled by the time you retrieve it the next morning. I know it's the kind of the rage of archery hunting these days. You know, you see it on camera a lot. Man, we don't know if we made a great shot, so we're not going to bump them. We're going to wait till the morning, you know, and go in in the morning. You do that with the bear in Arkansas on opening season, and you've ruined your bear. I can assure you of that. Bears have a lot of muscle mass, a lot of fat. They don't disperse that heat like a deer does. They sit there and soak it up, and plus it's all under a fur blanket in the end of September in Arkansas. Make a good shot. Know where your shot was. Give the animal time to expire, then go retrieve the animal. Do not let it lay overnight just because you were unsure of the shot because uh, it will be spoiled. Uh, uh, if most of the time on, you know, on, on bear hunting, even if you're hunting over a trail on public or if you're hunting a bait site on private, most of the time you're going to be within 20 yards, 25 yards tops. Uh, you know, if a bear comes down a trail or comes to a bait site. And so, I mean, you know, uh, I understand there's a lot of adrenaline going and, you know, you can miss a shot because of that. Uh, but missing the shot because of shooting too far, it's just not something that you're typically going to do in a bear hunting situation. So uh, you're going to have a controlled I guess an area uh, and everything is going to be controlled about it. So make a good shot, know what your shot, be ethical about your recovery of that animal. So, uh, and you know, most of the time it is going to be hot and uh, in start of bow season. Uh, the essential gear checklist, I always tell everyone it's important to be prepared for success. Uh, if you're hunting alone, you're really going to have to be prepared. Uh, if you're hunting with two or three other individuals, you're still going to have to be prepared to deal with a harvested animal and deal with it pretty quickly after you harvest the animal. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean if you shoot a bear right before dark, you're going to be recovering that bear at dark. You're not going to let it lay overnight. You don't have to worry about I can't walk in there with a wounded bear. He's going to attack me. No, he's not. A bear's not going to attack you any more than a wounded deer would attack you if you went to recover a deer. If they hear you coming and they're still alive, a bear is going to react just like a deer. They're going to get up and they're going to run away and you're going to hear them running away. Uh, but they're not going to attack you. Don't be afraid to go out there in the dark with a wounded bear. Uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, bears will make a, quote, death moan. Uh, bears really, uh, they probably don't run as far on average as deer do on a lethal shot. Uh, deer are prey animals. Bear are predators. So they react differently to being 
shot, especially with a bow that's relatively quiet. Uh, if you shoot a bear with a bow, you know, they're, they're going to jump and, you know, they may make a sound or something like that, and they're going to take off in the woods. Most of the time, if it's a good fatal shot, a double lung or a heart or even a liver, uh, most of the time they're not going to run very far at all. And they're going to kind of sit out there and they think, what just happened to me? You know, they're going to react different. Uh, a deer, you harvest a deer or shoot a deer with the bow, even if it's a heart shot, that deer is going to run full blast out until it dies running and it'll just fall over. Uh, bears don't react that way. So uh, keep that in mind when recovering a bear. But if you hunt the evening, chances are you're going to be harvesting a bear at night or recovering a bear at night. Take plenty of flashlights. Take you some rope and take you a tarp. Uh, and if you have some friends, call them on the phone, call them on the radio and have them come help you. Uh, I can tell you uh, from experience a bear is very, very difficult to deal with in the woods. Uh, they do not have handles. Uh, even your average size bear, 175 pound bear, uh, they have no handles. They have no antlers to grab. Uh, and you can't grab a log this big around and do anything with it. And I always tell people, if you want to know what it's like trying to drag a bear, fill up a water uh, waterbed mattress, put a couple of hundred pounds of water in it, and then go trying to drag it through the woods. Because that's exactly what it's like with the bear. So be prepared for success. I typically make uh, a pair of rope cuffs. I call them rope cuffs, and we use them doing den work and and whenever I recover a bear, if you have a sled, that's fine. If you have a game cart, that's fine. Uh, if you're hunting a 500 pound bear, don't expect a game cart to do the job because it's not. You're more than likely gonna have to take care of the bear in the field and bring him out in parts because I can assure you the biggest mules or the biggest four wheeler is not gonna do much with a 500 pound male. So, uh, if, you, if you're hunting bigger bear and you have a chance, have plenty of flashlights, have plenty of sharp knives if you have to take care of something out in the woods. If you're gonna be able to drag it out, make rope cuffs. Take a long piece of good nylon rope and tie a loop on each end. Fold the loops over and pull the rope back through the loops. And it makes a perfect pair of handcuffs. I call them rope cuffs. You can put on the bear's front feet and back feet and you can have teams of people drag them out that way. I've done it before. So, or you can put them on a, a real heavy tarp, but a lot of times moving bears on a heavy tarp, you know, each people, person grab a corner and go that way, they get ripped or whatever else, and it's kind of hard to deal with that way. So, whatever environment you're hunting in, if you can get a four-wheeler right up to where a bear is going to be, that's great. If you're hunting right next to a ravine and you know the bear is going to go off down in that, be prepared for that. I mean, be prepared for success. Uh, bear hide is extremely tough. Their hair is extremely coarse. Uh, and if you have to skin a bear out there, you're going to need plenty of sharp knives or scalpel or scalpel handle with plenty of good scalpels. I tell people that bear hide and, and skinning one is exactly like skinning uh, wild hogs, if you've ever skinned a wild hog. A deer, if you've skinned a deer, you can get it started and just pull the skin down and, you know, strip a deer a lot by few cuts and brute force. Bear, you will skin every inch of that bear with your knife. You don't just grab the hide and strip them down. Uh, you will skin literally every inch of that bear with your knife. So have plenty of knives or plenty of sharp instruments, whatever you use, scalpel, knives, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> also part of that success is being able to get that meat 
getting able to get the bear either eviscerated in the field or if you can be at a place like your cabin, well, you can be there in 30 minutes. You don't necessarily have to eviscerate it in the field, but you're going to have to be somewhere quick to get the entrails out of that animal. You're going to have to get that meat cooled down as soon as possible. Uh, uh, and that means in typical Arkansas weather opening weekend, Man, you need to have that deer either in an ice chest or a cooler with the skin off, uh, hanging probably within the first couple of hours for sure uh, of the time that animal's harvested. So, you know, have you an ice chest full of ice, uh, whatever it takes uh, to be able to get that meat cooled off you don't necessarily have to have all the fat cooled or cut off of it, but you do need to have the hide off and have it eviscerated or field dressed and quartered in the ice chest. So get the meat cooled because uh, I can assure you that bear meat that has been improperly taken care of in the field is one of the worst things you'll eat. Bear meat that has been taken care of properly in the field and processed correctly will be one of the best games you've ever eaten. Will be the best game you've ever eaten. It's better than elk. All right, so uh, after the hunt, you've harvested a bear. Uh, you've been able to recover the bear quickly. You got it back to your house or whatever. You got it skinned. You got it hindquarters or whatever cut and you know the parts quartered up and in the ice chest with some ice what are you going to do with it now uh, you have a couple of options uh, to take care of the cape uh, or the hide if you want to have a rug made or a mound or anything else like that if you want to do anything with the hide you need to get remove as much fat you can leave the feet and the skull in the hide uh, remember you have to extract the tooth and have it ready for submission when you receive your tooth envelope package from Game and Fish. Do not leave the tooth in the bear and then go freeze the bear or take it to your taxidermist. Because if your taxidermist doesn't come up with the tooth, you're going to receive the citation in about January uh, for failure to comply with the checking requirements of a bear. It is mandatory to supply or to submit a premolar. It's in the regulation guidebook on how to extract, where it's located, and how to submit it. But that is mandatory in order to fulfill your checking requirements for a bear. If you do not submit a premolar, you will receive a citation. Uh, it's failure to check. So taking care of the cape, after you've extracted the tooth out of the skull, you can remove all the fat off the hide. You can fold the hide skin to skin. Do not roll it up. If you roll it up, you're going to end up with 100 plus pounds of fur. And if you put that in your freezer, whatever's in the center of that ball of fur is going to take about two or three days to freeze completely. In the meantime, all the bacteria around those hair follicles are going to cause all that hair in the center of that, whether it be the head in the center or the heads on the outside and the rear of the bear is in the center of the ball. All the hair is going to slip off of that hide when it's thawed out and tanned because the bacteria is going to eat the hair follicles up. So fold your hide once over, twice over, and place it in the freezer flat, as flat as you can, to allow quick freezing, quick access to the temperature to freeze all the bacteria in that hide. If you roll it up and have a big ball of fur in your freezer, I can assure you the hair will slip in the center of that ball. Okay, so uh, you can leave the head and feet in or whatever. It's kind of up to you and your taxidermist. Uh, make the appropriate cut for the mount uh, I can assure you your taxidermist will probably give you a substantial financial break on a full body mount if you want to dorsal cut it 
That means cut it from the back of the head down the back to the tail and skin it out that way. Uh, or if you want to have a rug done, of course, you're going to go across the arms down the center of the chest and do it that way. But, uh, and you can do it that way for a full body mount. It's just your taxidermist is going to have about eight or ten feet of sewing to do as opposed to three or four foot on a dorsal cut. So it might save you some money on the taxidermist. Uh, meat care. Uh, as I said before, one of the worst things, uh, you know, I have people tell me all the time, man, I tried bear meat, and man, it was just awful. Either you're not a good cook or uh, you did not process the bear correctly in the field or when you took care of the meat. Uh, I have had uh, bear meat for years. I've had old bears. I've had young bears. I've had male bears. I've had female bears. And the great thing about bear meat is every bit of it tastes the same. Doesn't matter whether it's old or young, male or female. Uh, they're not in the rut that time of year. They don't have anything going on hormone-wise or anything else like that. Uh, so, and it is probably, I've had about every wild game out there. It is probably, it ranks up t to me at the top of the list, probably next to antelope. Uh, and uh, as far as texture, uh, I tell everyone the, the best thing I can relate good bear meat to is veal. To me, it tastes just like veal. Because bears are primarily herbivores, you know, they're eating herbaceous matter and everything. Uh, they're kind of lazy, so, you know, they don't have a lot of, I guess, stress on their muscles. Uh, it is, bear meat is always tender, and it, it's always a cross between beef and deer, or beef and elk. Uh, it's just a perfect, it's extremely mild, uh, and it always usually very tender. Uh, some of the favorite cuts that I typically have are bear roast, or roast them in a crock pot, uh, bear tips over rice, just like you would beef tips over rice. Uh, I do not typically make steaks with bear. Uh, I prefer steaks medium or medium rare. Uh, one thing you absolutely cannot do with bear meat is eat undercooked bear meat. Uh, let me emphasize that. Cook your bear meat thoroughly. Bears can carry trichinosis just like wild hogs or hogs can. And, you know, back in the old days, uh, you know, you had to cook pork thoroughly. You didn't have to burn it, uh, but you had to cook it thoroughly through. Same thing you would with pork, cook your bear meat through. Uh, I use ground bear meat for uh, stews, for soups, for chili, uh, and you can use it anything you would any other wild game for, and you can process it just as you would it, any other wild game. Uh, the two key factors is cook it thoroughly and remove every bit of the extrastitial fat, the outside fat, off of the meat before you process it. You know, a lot of people put uh, beef fat in with deer when they're having deer processed because deer meat is so lean and they really don't have any fat. Well, bear meat is not lean by any means. They have a lot of marbling fat, but they also have a lot of extrastitial fat, fat outside the meat, between the meat and the skin. Remove every bit of that in the processing. If you're going to take your meat to have it processed somewhere, I would advise you strongly to sit out there and whittle all the fat off of those quarters before you take it to a processor to have them grind it up or whatever else. Because, you know, they may or may not do it. To ensure that it is done, uh, I would advise doing it before you took it to a processor. If you do it on your own, do your own processing, then certainly trim every bit of the outside fat off uh, before you process any of your cuts or make any of your ground meat. So that's from start to finish, bear hunting A to Z. As I said before, this is a little bit different format than I typically would, uh, that I have done in the past about 
giving bear hunting seminars across the state. I know a lot of you may have questions that relate to your individual circumstance or, uh, uh, or situation with bear hunting, whether it be public or private land. Uh, you can email me uh, any questions you might have, or um, maybe the best thing would be to uh, contact me through the uh, uh, Game and Fish Facebook, or contact me through the Fort Smith Regional Office, uh, it's the office that I'm out of, and I'd be more than happy to talk bear hunting, and or to you know help you out with any specific situation you might have. Happy hunting everyone, hope you have a successful year, be safe in the woods.